So we can all begin by saying thank you to Brother Mark, all right? Mark gave me this microphone, and I said, Mark, how good are the batteries on this? And he said, the batteries are good for 14 hours, all right? So uh, Paul, uh, Pastor Paul, uh, there's a button down here, locks the doors, right? So we're good, okay, cool. He's gonna check it for me, okay, good deal, good deal. So, but uh, you know, as uh, Pastor Paul said, and uh, you know, I, I always like, I like to have a sense of humor. I was telling some of the uh, other folks I was talking to, you know, this year, April 1st, or sorry, uh, 2020, April 1st, April Fool's Day was on a Wednesday night, right? So my wife is big on April Fool's Day and she tries to get me every year. Can't wait to see what she has planned this year. So this year we ordained our dog through the Universal Life Church. It's a website. People actually legitimately use it to try to get ordained, right? So I thought it would be hilarious, you know, to put the receipt in all the other receipts to give to our treasurer. Miss Carla, if you saw a receipt saying, you know, gas expense, you know, lunch expense, whatever, ordination for a dog, you know, <laughs> it was kind of a kind of a fun thing. But then COVID hit and we weren't meeting at church. So I drove to his house and put it in his mailbox because how can you let that kind of thing go? But it was it was a lot of fun and he still talks to me, so that's pretty good. So, uh, you know, interesting things there. But, uh, you know, as Pastor Paul said, happy anniversary, happy 20th anniversary to Heritage Baptist Church. And I got the name right, so I'm good. I did that a couple times at Lighthouse, and, you know, it's there's really no going back from that. So you just got to embrace it and move on, right? But um, I want to just, you know, as we uh, a couple people discussed about, talked about it, anniversaries remind us of the good and the bad from the past, right? We, there's a lot of positives, a lot of negatives. You know, there's always... Uh, churches have life, right? Life has positive, it has bright spots, it has dark spots, it has negative spots. So what God wants us to do is learn from all of those things, right? All of those things that, that we come across, there's value in those things. It's better to learn and embrace them than to try to forget about them and brush them under the rug. So it is a time to celebrate, a time to reflect. And along those lines, we have memorials, right? You have memorials, you have monuments, uh, I think there's a monument still over on the, the corner over there, and uh, Tony's not here right now, but, you know, we told Tony, yeah, take this sledgehammer and go, you know, start trying to knock that down. That was years ago, a different administration, you know, so not <laughs> Pastor Paul's fault. So the police thought he was vandalizing it, you know. When the police came over, we're like, Tony who? And he's like, that's just funny, you know, so it was, it was pretty funny for us, but, you know, he appreciated it later. But uh, memorials or, you know, monuments, they're there to celebrate the memory of an event while anniversaries remember a day. And to that end, uh, you all know your anniversaries? Hopefully, okay, cool. Paul, you just had one, right? Okay, yeah, there you go. So it's good to know your anniversaries and it's good to think back to what that day means to you. So, you know, as we shared a couple things today, you know, I was thinking about memorial services and those usually happen after somebody dies and everybody says, oh, that was a great person, good memories. And, you know, my thought is, that's often wasted because the person would have rather have heard how great they were or you know, been able to connect with their friends and loved ones while they still had time, right? So it was really good, it was encouraging to hear some you know, voices, uh, newer voices, more mature voices, I didn't say old, more mature voices of you know, the history of heritage, right? How we've come together from different walks of life, different backgrounds, uh, you know, different areas all come together to serve the Lord together and to, to learn and grow in God's word. So, you know, it's nice to hear that. And uh, I'm going to skip over my slide here that says who will go first because you beat me to it. So nice job. But uh, my memories, a couple memories that I have here. Uh, you know, a lot of my memories here have to do with buses, right? And for better or for worse, you know, most, mostly better, mostly better. But I, I put in here kind of tongue in cheek, you know, learning how to be the awesome parents we are today because of all the bus lessons learned, including thinking quick. We're outnumbered, right? And we had uh, just so many, you know, funny stories on the bus. Uh, one teenager, you know, he was, he was speaking in a different language and I didn't know what he was saying, but I didn't think it was good, right? So I, I mustered my courage and I said, knock it off right now. And he's like, ah, like that. I had no idea what he said, but he knew it was bad and it worked. I, he didn't call my bluff. So for that, I was happy. But so as a parent, you have to know how to bluff and you have to know how to try to not laugh when the kids are doing something, you know, bad but funny. So think quick because you are outnumbered. Another one, keep them busy, right? If they're busy doing something, then they're not going to be doing something else like planning your demise. So keep them busy, know where they are and try to keep them in their seats. Um, Brother Mike, we always told Brother Mike, 
tell the kids three to a seat. So we had a 66 passenger bus, you know, and the seats were your usual typical size. So a couple times, you know, a few times, the bus was over capacity, it was like full. So Mike is doing what he's told, he's going down the rows, three to a seat, three to a seat, three to a seat, three to a seat. And there was this one teenager, he was probably about 300 pounds, he was a big football player, and he barely fit in the seat by himself. And Mike's like, three to, and the kid's just like looking at him like, I'm like, Mike, next row, next row. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of good, good memories. You know, another one, snacks are good, but dodgeball is best. Yes, we played dodgeball on the bus. And we, had a, we took a line drive right to the headlight switch and it knocked the headlights out, but, you know, turn it back on. And if you're ever in the middle of a game of dodgeball and you decide that you don't want to play anymore, the last thing you want to do is stand up and say, I'm not playing, because you know what happens. You are playing and you're the target, okay? So don't do those things. Um, some other memories, you know, more serious note on the bus, where God provided for us. You know, one of the first missions trips we did that I was part of, uh, we had a short bus. Short buses are fun, but 20 year old ones that, you know, needed some work are not so much fun. But uh, we decided, Pastor Chris, that was his fault, we decided to go see a missionary up off of Prince Edward Island in Canada. It was a five hour ferry ride off of the island. So it was way, way out there. We drove the bus around. I think we had a couple of nursing mothers on the bus with babies. So it must have been a real sight. Well, it got better when one of the diesel uh, fuel lines under the hood started leaking. So now the whole drive back, we were you know, running on seven cylinders, blowing white smoke behind us with a couple of nursing mothers and a bunch of kids on there. It was you know, fantastic. So, but we made it, brought us back here uh, safely. Our trip, we, uh, I think Carla, you went to, on this one. Uh, it was down to the Creation Museum. You know, and we took the big bus down there and we had a, a safe, uneventful trip until on the way back uh, in Batavia, New York, I wasn't driving, wasn't my fault that time, uh, the, the fan broke off under the hood and it took part of the you know, mount with it, went right into the radiator. And you know, when, you're, you know, when your belt stops spinning, your air compressor stops spinning, your brake pressure starts dropping, but the Lord saw fit to have this happen at the one exit where there's an international bus garage. Now, if that doesn't make you, you know, think and get a little teary, then you think about that, because we had driven down to Kentucky all the way back up, and it's the one exit where there was an international bus garage, right? It was also the exit where one of the members that uh, was coming here, his brother lived there. So him and his, his brother drove over, he took a couple guys to the airport, and they just happened, just happened to have three minivans left, which just happened to be enough space to get all of us back here to church and you know we got here at what two in the morning but we were open on Sunday the next day yes driving the short bus uh, you know out there and you know the game the show the show I call it went on so God provided numerous numerous ways for us other times the bus broke down on Sunday morning coming back from Niskayuna and we only had about five or six kids on the bus which was a very low number coming over a hill all of a sudden hitting the, the gas nothing's happening the flex plate broke and you know, I coasted it across four lanes of traffic into a gas station, and the Lord provided once again for us. So, you know, I, I like to pick on the bus a little bit, but there was so many good lessons, and a lot of us here were involved with it. You know, whether praying or you know supporting it or supporting it, uh, or you know working and helping on the bus or helping the kids that came as a result of that ministry. So it was it was very very good. But some ministry memories, some things that I've learned uh, specifically, always be prepared what's going to happen. Things happen all the time, and you know, like, what do you do with it? Uh, be careful with pronunciations, all right? People like their names to be said correctly. There's some tough names in the Bible, so practice those, otherwise you can be quickly embarrassed. And probably the best one, don't do random sword drills from the book of Leviticus, all right? That doesn't work well, you know? When a kid starts reading and you're like, okay, let's move on to the next one, you know? So don't do random sword drills from the book of Leviticus. Don't leave your laptop open uh, this was a Pastor Chris. Uh, he left his laptop open, and somebody thought it would be funny to change the text from English to Spanish. Pastor Chris doesn't know Spanish, and well, that was pretty funny. He's like, you know, we're like, what's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? Yeah, it was it was pretty good. And uh, lastly, probably most importantly, is wear your seatbelt and helmet when Brother Mike is driving. But let's move on. <laughs> so, so a lot of lot of fun stuff. I mean, we can laugh, we can look back at it, we can laugh about it, and you know, just have a really positive positive memories of all that. But you know, changing gears here, the Bible speaks of memorials often. 
Uh, we look at a few of them, and I just want to sort of touch base on a couple, you know, to get you in the right mindset. We see in Exodus chapter 12, we see the, the Passover, right? Just a few verses here. Exodus chapter 12, <clears throat> verses 12 through uh, 14, the Bible recollects the Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, well, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And where I see, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It sounds like a song, doesn't it? It is. Uh, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, and this day shall be unto you for memorial, there's that word, and you shall keep, uh, keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever, right? It was a time where they looked back and said, wow, God had provided for us. We were in a, literally a terrible spot, but God provided for us. He gave us instructions that if you do this, you and your family in the home will be safe. And for those that did it, they saw the next day that they were safe. And those that didn't, well, you know, they experienced the consequences. So there's one memorial right there. He says, do this, you know, keep this memorial, keep this feast, remember what happened so you can learn and be encouraged for the next problem that you'll face in life, which often isn't too far away. Uh, another uh, great example, Joshua chapter 22, uh, starting in verse 9. The Bible says, uh, oh, sorry, I gave you the wrong reference there. Uh, Joshua 4, uh, 1 through 7, a different, different example. Joshua 4, 1 through 7, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command ye them, saying, take, ye, take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. Now remember, the priests were standing with the ark in the middle of the river, holding back the water, and they passed on through. So it says, go in there, take 12 stones, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodge, uh, lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the 12 men uh, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were out of before, out, were cut off uh, before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel again forever. So it's something that it's reminding one more time about how God had acted on their behalf, how he specifically intervened to help. Now, it's a pretty strong remembrance to think, yeah, yeah, they were standing, they're walking, they stopped traffic on the River Jordan. You know, it's not something that just happens overnight. Oh, yeah, the, the river stopped again. Pastor Paul, you saw the river stop again this week, right? You know, they just turned the dam off. That's what it was. No, not at all. This was a, a miracle. It was God providing for them again. All right, uh, one more, uh, another example. First Samuel chapter 7, thir uh, verse 13, uh, we see here, uh, the Bible says, and when the Philistines heard the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. Now the Philistines were the, the, the nice friendly neighbors of Israel. They got along together so often. And now the, the Philistines were just coming to, to give them a farewell or to give them a, a neighborly hello. Is that what was happening? No, not at all. They were at war. They hated each other. The Philistines were always trying to harass them. And the Bible says, when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it uh, for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. I'll tell you this, the Lord hears us when we pray too, all right? So the Lord heard him, and the Bible says, and as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder uh, on that day upon the Philistines, and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel, 
And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until uh, they came unto Bethken, or Bethkar. Uh, then Samuel took a stone, a memorial, Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and uh, Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. I love the song, Come Thou Fount, because it says, Here I raise my Ebenezer, my sign of victory. It's a point where God has helped, a very real physical place where they could look back and say, I remember that day where God helped us. And if we look back in our lives, we can see the same thing where God has helped us, he's provided for us. And a lot of people talk about journaling, about writing these things down. And it's really important to do that, because otherwise, you know, lest we forget, lest we say, oh, you know, God's not interested in my current problem. I'm all by myself. I better just go as, you know, Saul did. I, I forced myself. I did it, you know. Don't do that. Look at the times God has helped and say, God, I don't know how you're going to work this out. You know, I may have messed up personally. It might be my fault, but God, help me, please, get through this, and I'll give all the glory to you. So we see Samuel did the same thing. He said, here's my Ebenezer, my sign of victory. Samuel took a stone, set it between, called the name of Ebenezer, saying, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So the result, so the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So three examples right there from the Old Testament. One quick one, one, quick one from the New Testament, and then we'll, we'll continue on. Luke chapter 22, verse 17 through 20. We, we know this is a very familiar passage of scripture. The Bible says, uh, and, Jesus, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after, uh, the, after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So we all know, we're all very familiar with that. This do in remembrance of me. Why do we take communion? Is communion, you know, is it going to benefit us in a, in a sacramental form? No, but communion is there for us to remember that God's blood was spilled on the ground for us to cover our sin, the only way our sins could be forgiven. It's a, a reminder to make sure that we are you know, right with God. We are living in a way that would be pleasing to God. And as the Bible says, if, you're, if you have sins that you haven't confessed, if you're not at that spot where you can take it, don't take it unless you're taking it worthily. Otherwise, you're adding damnation to yourself, and it's not a wise thing to do. So keep these just little you know, memorials, these reminders in mind, and say, hey, what has God done in my life to help me, right? And you can think about those things. I'm gonna get to this in a little bit, but we love to hear personal examples, right? You know, I, I work in a bank, I'm a, a bank manager, and you know, people like to hear personal examples about how you were able to help them. You know, if, if Pastor Paul's uh, great uncle Charlie had a neighbor named Tom, and you know, somebody did something nice for Tom, and I tell Carla about that. Did you hear the story about, uh, let me get this right, Pastor Paul's great uncle, Charlie, who's cousin Tom, I just messed that up. But that means nothing to you, does it? You're just gonna nod your head and say, okay, that's great. But if I say to you, hey, you know, or, or Miss Bonnie, hey, you know, I give blood because you know, everybody that gives blood helps people, and my little boy, when he needed it, all, this, all these blood donations came in handy and saved his life. That's a much more personal testimony. That's something that's gonna elicit a response from people. So if we have examples that we can share with others and say, this is how God intervened specifically in my life, they're gonna listen to that, and that might be the, the invitation that they need to be able to share more about the gospel with them, right? You know, be specific and be vulnerable. Don't be afraid to tell people and show people how God has worked in your life. That's, that's what people want. It's authentic, it's real, and they want to be part of that. So let's take a look, um, just you know, a quick recap on these. Each example recalls a specific act of God's providence at just the right time. Uh, Exodus was a release from bondage. Joshua was a recounting of God's promises. First Samuel, relying on God's protection. Luke, uh, redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Revisiting or thinking about these memorials is not enough. Um, Jess made a chocolate cake the other week. It was a little bit after you know, uh, Valentine's Day. And you know, it looked good then. I had a piece, she let me have a piece, so I was very thankful for that. And you know, now it's in the freezer. And we're gonna you know, pull it out a little bit later and hopefully have some if I get home in time, so I better hurry up. 
But, uh, you know, it's, it's there, and it was really, really good. But is that cake going to be good in one year from now if I take it out of the freezer? I really hope not, right? This isn't college anymore, so we can't do that anymore, all right? But, you know, memorials are good to look back and say, wow, that was great. You know, God did some awesome things. But if we look back at that and say, well, that was my glory day. That was the, the high point in my life. It's all downhill from there. Is that going to help us today? Is that going to motivate us to get out of bed today and do what we should today? Absolutely not. In fact, nobody really cares what you did before. They want to know what you're doing right now. You know, I love the, the movie Facing the Giants and the you know, football movie. And I know a lot about football. No, I, I'm behind a pulpit. I can't lie. No, I know nothing about football except that they usually have pretty good food to eat. So I like to watch the games, okay? But um, in, the, in the Facing the Giants movie, the coach, I believe it was that movie, he made a great example. He goes, you know, who was the, you know, the, the state championship from five years ago? Nobody knew, right? Who was the state championship last year? Nobody knew. His point was, nobody knows about the past. Nobody really cares about the past. It's what you're doing today that counts, right? The Bible says, if you look in the Bible, you know, there's a lot of people that were saved out of terrible, wicked lifestyles. You know, the Apostle Paul was on his way to kill uh, or imprison people of the way. And those people are Christians, right? God used him and God said, hey, forget those things that are behind you. Press forward, you know, look ahead. If anybody could have said, you know, I'm disqualified, God can't use me, I killed his people. Paul would have been that guy. But Paul also had an experience. He met the Lord on the road to Damascus. The Lord got his attention and the Lord said, hey, Paul, I'm gonna use you. And Paul took that and ran with that for the rest of his life. That was enough for him to you know, withstand the, the laundry list of things, you know, shipwrecked, you know, you, you survive a shipwreck, you get bit by a snake, and, and you're like, wow, you must be a really bad person, you know? But no, God uses these things to make an impact on his life and others. Memorials are designed to propel us forward in faith as we consider and remember past accomplishments, achievements, and victories. Living in the past or relying on previous accomplishments is not what we are called to do. As Paul said, we are to press toward the mark. So how do we balance the great victories experienced by our cloud of witnesses? How do we, we look at those and say, those were great, and then we, how do we balance that and say, how do we use that in 2021, right? We're not gonna have any struggles in 2021. All the struggles were used up last year. So this is gonna be a great year. Somebody say amen, please, no, okay. So we do this through faith in God faith in his plan for us, and faithfully discharging the duties he's assigned to us. Everybody knows the role that we have. If you don't have a role in this church, go talk to Pastor Paul, and then help him off the floor. If everybody were to line up and say, he's like, oh, uh, we wanna, we're here to help you. You know, pastors love that kind of thing, where people just come to them and say, what can we do to help you? You like that kind of thing? Love it, okay? That's better. He would rather have that instead of going to get a steak. You know, Hello, does, does this work? Uh, Mike, okay, turn it back on, I'll be good, I'll be good, all right. So, but uh, you get the idea. Pastors want people to be part of the church, not because it makes their job easier, which it does, but because he knows that when you invest in God's work, right, you're laying up treasures in heaven, you're getting fellowship, you're encouraging each other, you're edifying. It's all those positive things that the New Testament talks about. It's the things that we should put to work practically and do. So that's what God wants us to do. He wants our faith to move us forward. Now, now, I just had to put this in here just as a bonus. Faith is a substance, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. You want a good report? Have faith, exercise your faith, right? And it's not that it's going to earn you favor with God, but it's showing him thanks for all the things that he has done for you. A great example of faith in action, being motivated by your memorial, is found in Matthew chapter 13, and that's the text for today's message. This was just the introduction, and uh, Mark gave me the battery life indicator. We're about 12 hours left, so we're good to go. Uh, so Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower, is going to be where we're going to take a look today. And uh, I'll give you guys a moment to get there, then we'll bow our heads and we'll pray and ask God for wisdom uh, as we jump into the message today. All right? So as you're turning there, I just want to say parables are a great tool because everyone loves to hear a story, Right? And the nice thing about a story is the story stays with you, and you might get it wrong, you might mix, mix up the punchline, but usually it stays with you, and you can get enough of it to where somebody will be like, I know what you're talking about, and then 
you don't miss the point. So parables are a great tool, um, but there is more to the story. There's the important piece that God wants us to hear. Uh, as you reflect on the story, the truth of the parable makes itself known. If I were to say tortoise and the hare, what would you say? Nobody said yes, please, for lunch? Okay, good. Uh, but if I say tortoise and the hare, you guys say, what's the, the, the story behind it? What's the, the moral behind that? Take your time. Slow but steady wins the race, right? Yeah, so everybody remembers that because it's, it's a practical application. It's a practical story. So uh, if everybody's there in Matthew chapter 13, let's take a moment. We'll pray and ask God for some, some wisdom with understanding his word today. Father, we thank you this 20th anniversary. We thank you for the memories that were shared this morning, the, the testimonies of salvation, of growth, of, of um, just being encouraged to push ahead in serving uh, you, Lord. We thank you for those things. And Father, many uh, didn't have the opportunity to speak, but I'm, I'm taking a guess that there's a lot more of encouraging uh, memories out there. And Father, just thank you so much for, for looking kindly on Heritage Baptist Church, for providing, for working uh, in many ways miraculously to keep, uh, keep things going when, when there were problems, when there were you know, facility problems, when there were just all types of things that would, would be discouraging to us. You, you saw fit to allow uh, this church to overcome and to overcome well. Father, I pray most importantly right now you'd help us to see uh, what we can learn from Scripture, how we can be motivated by our memorials. And also, Father, if there is someone here that doesn't know you as the personal Lord and Savior, if there's somebody that's listening to us by way of our broadcast that has never taken the time to ask you to forgive their sins and said, God, I trust only in you to forgive my sins and to be my Savior. Father, I pray that they would see from the message today, from your words as it's preached, that salvation is key, that without salvation there's there's no other point, there's no other way to be saved, there's no other way to avoid the, the, the Satan's hell that was prepared for those who reject God. Father, help us to not reject, but to wholeheartedly accept, help us to serve you, help us to make great memories as we remember the ways you've worked for us in the past. And Father, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so Matthew chapter 13, it's the parable of sowing of the seed you know, sowers. I'm going to read a few verses of that and we'll jump right in. Uh, the Bible says, the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spake many things unto them in parables saying, behold, a sower went forth to sow. And a sower, you know, they, they didn't work for a, you know, a uh, stitching company, it was a sower. They'd go and, you know, throw seed and, you know, sow seed. It's, yeah, make sure you spell it S-O-W, not S-E-W. I had to go back and make a couple changes here. So thankfully it's not in the big screen, otherwise that'd be embarrassing. But I just told you that. So, but uh, you get the idea. So a sower went forth to sow. The Bible says, and he spake many things to them um, uh, in parables, saying, behold, the sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Uh, some fell upon stony, uh, upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. Uh, and when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So, you know, Matthew 13, uh, 1 through 9, sowing the seed. Have you ever sowed seed by hand? A lot of us have big farms that we live on, we work on, right? Nobody? All right. So we have a garden, and, you know, we try to teach the kids, oh, this is how you, you know, put the seeds out there. And they're like, why? Why do we have to do this? Why don't we just go to the store and buy them? Get back in your room, you know. So it's something that farmers would understand a whole lot better than us. But I like to, you know, think of it this way. Have you ever tried salting a sidewalk? A little bit better. We live in the Northeast. We don't want lawsuits. So what do we do? We throw, you know, salt out on the ground. Now you can just take a cup and you can just go and boom and dump it right there, right? But is that going to be effective? No, you need to spread the salt around. And do you have ultimate control over where all that salt ends up? No, you're just spreading the salt. You have a bucket of salt, you have a limited supply of salt. If there's a big storm, you wanna get as much salt out as possible to prepare the ground 
as best as you can, right? Because if you have a driveway that has any kind of slope to it, that can turn into a big alley, as, you're, as the kids say, as you're sliding down the driveway. And then you get up and you fall again on your keys and it really hurts. I don't speak from experience. I saw the video on this somewhere. Um, but salt, like seed, goes everywhere. Not always as desired, but seed, like salt, is powerful. Seed may remain dormant or grow any time, even in the most unusual places. Now, I've seen seeds, I've seen little plants growing out of gutters. Hopefully not at my house, but you know, seeds contain life, and life wants to grow wherever it has opportunity. But what does a seed need? A seed needs soil, it needs sunlight, it needs water. Without those things, it's not going to survive. We see here, we are responsible to faithfully distribute the seed. The sower's job was to sow, right? The sower's job wasn't to run calculations on atmospheric pressure and say, is today a good day to sow seed? Um, I think we might have a, a rain issue in sector four of the field, so I'm not gonna go over there today. They wouldn't even know what I was talking about. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. But the sower's job was not to say, ah, what do I do? The sower's job was to be faithful and sow the seed. We are responsible to faithfully distribute that seed, to get it out there. The seed is the word of God. The seed uh, is responsible, or you know, the ground, I should say, is responsible to receive it and to grow, to take what you're given and grow with it. So we take a look at it and we, we see the four types of ground. Now the first one, the wayside, the wayside was the path where people walked and nothing could grow because the ground was too hard. You know, I was trying to put in a, a gate in January and you guys know what happens to the ground in the Northeast in January, right? It's, it's nice and supple, you can just go over there with your kid's little, you know, Tonka truck and you can move the dirt around, it's not frozen at all, right? No, it's rock solid. In fact, it took, I was trying to get down about 18 inches to put a fence post in because that's what some crazy people do in January sometimes, I guess. And I was out there with an air chisel, a little little air chisel with a 150, 150 foot air hose chiseling away at this, at this dirt right here. And it's a good thing Pastor Paul wasn't here because he probably would have you know, laughed and then maybe called the psych ward and say, hey, we lost one over here. you know. But thankfully, I had a neighbor walk by and he goes, I hate to see people using the wrong, wrong tool for something. I'm like, so do I, you know? So he goes, would you like a jackhammer? Would you like a, a, a hammer drill? I'm like, I would love a hammer drill. Within 10 minutes, I was down 18 inches and you know, I was very happy and also very cold at that point, but very happy to see things work, right? Why did I have such trouble getting through the ground? Because it was frozen, it was compacted, it was, I think, double frozen, right? Somebody poured ice on it just to make sure I didn't have any success. But understand how hard and, how, uh, hard and compact this soil is. The wayside was where people walked and walked and walked. Not, nothing could grow because the ground was too hard, all right? So stony places, the next one, stony places were where the soil was thin, right? Um, some places, you know, if you're gonna be a farmer, you wanna make sure that you have good soil. You wanna make sure that it's gonna, the seed's gonna hit, it's gonna grow, and you're gonna be in a good spot. If the seed hits and there's nothing there, the seed's just gonna waste. It might sprout, but then it's gonna die quickly. There was no uh, rock, uh, you know, it was like living uh, upon a rock shelf, rocky shelf. On this ground, the seed springs up quickly because of the warmth of the soil, but the seed is unable to take root because of the rocky shelf. There's nothing to dig into. Among thorns uh, describes soil that is fertile, perhaps too fertile, because thorns grow very well as grain. You know, the grain grows great, but so does everything else, right? So good ground is soil that is both fertile and weed free. A good productive crop grows in the good ground. So, uh, and now let's take a look, why parables? You know, Jesus spoke in parables very frequently, and sometimes the apostles even, or the disciples rather, still said, why, why parables? So we see in verse uh, 10 through 17, and the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but, in, but to them it is not given. For whosoever uh, hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear, and, uh, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. 
for this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are you, I'm sorry, blessed are your eyes, and uh, for they see, and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So, you know, why parables? Well, think of it this way. To the humble and honest heart, uh, to the humble, uh, those that are receiving, those that are listening and looking to God for wisdom, those that are asking, those that are seeking, they will get a response. They will understand the parable. But those that are not seeking, uh, they have a hard heart, they, they're not going to get it. They're going to hear a story. And you think about the level of compassion that's built into this. God knows at that point that they were not ready to hear this. They've already hardened themselves, and he knows that if somebody's not willing to repent, if they're not saved, what's going to happen to them? The Bible says their destination is an eternity in hell, right? So this right here, he's not making it any worse. If they had heard more and more and more, they're responsible for more and more and more. So by speaking in a parable, the ones that want it, the ones that can get it, are getting it. The ones who are rejecting, he's actually saving them by preventing them from being more responsible for more truth that they've gotten because they've rejected themselves. They've rejected the truth. The Bible, or just a, a little quote here, the same sun that softens the wax hardens the clay. So what is it that we're doing with the word that we're hearing? Are we allowing it to you know, soften us, to, to purify us, to help us, or are we taking it and allowing it to harden ourselves? The parable reveals truth to him who desires truth, but conceals it from him who does not wish to see truth. The Bible says, I, I view it as an act of mercy by a loving savior. Those refusing to hear are condemned already. Why make it worse, right? Another example of love towards those needing salvation, by not hearing, they are being spared from more judgment. God's goal is that they get saved. His goal is that they hear, that they listen, but you're not going to force it on them. If you were to try to force somebody to get saved, is that going to work for you? Absolutely not. The goal is that they should hear and be saved. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We see here, uh, he continues, he says, you know, they hear and not understand, they see and not perceive. He said their heart is calloused, their ears are dull, their eyes are closed. Jesus wants their eyes to see, he wants their ears to hear, and he has performed these miracles before. He made the blind uh, able to see. He made the deaf able to speak. He could do that. He could force them to be able to hear, but he wants their heart. He wants their heart to be uncalloused to accept the gift of salvation. He says, lest at any time they should see, hear, understand, and should be converted. Jesus is ready and willing to save, but he will not use force to see it happen. We go a little bit further, you know, the irony here. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 speaks of generations desiring to see the Messiah, spending their entire life studying, seeking, yet dying in the faith, having not seen the Messiah, not seeing Jesus. Simeon, I love the story of Simeon, he clung to the promise that he would hold the baby Jesus before he died, and he did, and it made his life. He died a happy man. Many from, from that in our generation missed the free gift of salvation because of hardened hearts, calloused hearts where they were unwilling to listen, unwilling to repent, and to them, they just heard a happy story. Oh, a farmer, yeah, that's great. My dad was a farmer, my grandpa was a farmer. They missed it, right? And because of their dulled senses and trusting in themselves. So we will go ahead a little bit to the parables explained, and we'll see starting with the wayside. The Bible says in verse 18, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower, when any one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he uh, which received seed by the wayside, but he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy received it. Yet hath he not room, hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of the, 
the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But, verse 23, but he that receiveth se received seed into the good ground uh, is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, I'm sorry, some yeah, sixty, some thirty. So we see the wayside. The word has no effect because it never penetrates and is quickly taken away. It can't get through the solid ground. It can't burst its way through to be able to take root. Think of it as birds eating freshly fallen seed uh, before the seed gets covered and develop roots. Uh, Satan, or you know, the bird here, always is seeking to destroy, always seeking to find that fresh seed and get it and you know, compromise it before it has time to do what it was designed to do. And that's to take root and to grow. Um, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Satan wants to keep them in the dark concerning their spiritual condition, lest they see the light and be converted. The natural thing for a seed to do is to plant and grow. If it can be destroyed, compromised, then Satan can win and prevent it from doing what it's designed to do. Uh, stony ground, the word is received enthusiastically, but because there is no depth, no resource to draw upon, when trouble or persecution for the word diminishes and evaporates, collapses due to pressure. Not necessarily lack of desire, but lack of conviction, lack of determination, lack of strength. And I just put a little note on the end there. Did anyone disciple that person? You know, they started out on fire. They're, yes, this is so awesome. This is so great. And then they get some trouble. And then, you know, their, their boss says, hey, um, you were going to church that night, and, you know, the boss doesn't like it, and they get, can, they get uh, in trouble, and there's nothing for them to fall back on. They didn't have that, that, um, that strength built up yet, and they wither away. Thorny ground. Some respond to the word and grow for a while, but are choked and stopped in their spiritual growth by competition from unspiritual things, right? There's a thousand activities we could be doing right now, but praise God we decided to be here in church or watching you know, via online. So it comes down to priorities. Uh, the next one, this soil, the good ground, the soil represents, I'm sorry, uh, thorny ground still. The soil represents fertile ground for the world, but perhaps too fertile as it also grows all sorts of other things that choke out the word of God. Namely, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches that choke out the word. Monitor yourselves. You know, a note on this one, remember the rich young ruler, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Hey, I'm doing that, it's fine. Go get rid of all your stuff. Sell your stuff and give it away. He was very, very sorrowful. He couldn't do it, right? So the next one, the last one, the good ground, 30, 60, 100 fold. These are all great harvest and are a testimony to the soil. God's desire for each of us is that we bear much fruit and be his disciples. Good ground discipleship requires discipline, requires commitment, faith, and obedience. Those four things working together is you know, what's going to cause the seeds to grow up and develop. Successful disciples help other disciples who are struggling, helping sift the thorns, remove the stones, and not get caught up by cares of the world. So if you're a little seed and you're growing pretty well and you look over and you see your other, your other neighboring seeds not doing so well, help them out. You know, help them be an encouragement to them. And I know it's a parable. I don't want to take it off the rails. But you know, as one Christian, as one church member looking at somebody else, help each other out. You know, I'm pretty sure the Bible talks about helping people, doesn't it? Mm, yeah, we could, we could go find out. No, okay. Um, so let me just jump here. All right, so conclusion. Uh, memorials are most successfully understood and attractive to others when there is that personal relationship. If you can share with somebody, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I care for you. This is why I'm praying for you. Then it gets their attention. It allows you to make a compelling case for others to see their need of the Savior and to be ready to share the gospel. If you just say, you know, hey, uh, my pastor said that uh, you should uh, get saved because it's, like, important, you know, well, that's great. But if you can tell them your personal example and your personal story, they're much more willing to listen. So in light of our memorial, in light of the anniversary celebrating 20 years of Heritage Baptist Church, what type of, sh what type of sower should we be? Well, last three things were good. So liberally. Ecclesiastes 11.1 1 says, cast your bread out in many waters. Make the investment. Cast that seed out as much as you can. Put it out and, you know, think about these guys back in the day. They would send out commercial ships, you know, deliveries. And what would happen to them? Did they have a GPS? No. That ship could sink. 
all your investment that you put into that could be lost forever. Well, you're being faithful putting the investment out, and that's what God wants us to do, so liberally, so lovingly. Psalm 126, 5 and 6, it talks about, you know, bearing the precious seed with tears. You know, there's great examples about people, you know, saying, you know, they use their tears to, to wet the seed before it was sown. Pour yourself into the seed that you're giving out, so liberally, so lovingly, and it'll doubtless come again. It'll come again, you know, larger than you would have expected, and God will bless it. So liberally, so lovingly, and so you later. That's a little bit of a play on words there. But Haggai uh, chapter 2, verse 19, God says to them, you have seed left, it's sitting in the warehouse, what's it doing in there? Get out, and you know, when you, when you die, make sure your seed bucket is empty. Make sure you've scraped all the dust out of the seed bucket and that nothing is left on the table, right? It doesn't matter how much money you have in your accounts and things like that, but use all the seed, use all the opportunities you've had to, to share the gospel, to get that out, to be an encouragement to others. So, so liberally, so lovingly, so you later, right? And last thing I'll say is this. God has been gracious and long-suffering towards each one of us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you have never asked Jesus to forgive your sins, then what are you waiting for, right? He's, he's done everything he could to save you. You know, there's nothing else he can do above and beyond that. Um, let your memorial motivate you. If you are saved, let the memorial, let the anniversary of Heritage Baptist Church's 20 years, let that motivate you to say, God, you've been with us before. I want to see what's going to happen in the next 20 years. Not in 2021, but that's going to be really good, I know, because it can't be bad like 2020. But let me, you know, I want to be part of this church's next 20 years of success, right? And, you know, pray about it, ask God, and then go ask Pastor Paul. Surprise him. Make sure you're there to help him off the ground, you know, when he passes out, right? But make sure, invest what you have. You may have a little bucket of seed. You may have a big bucket of seed. Everything that you have, get it out on the table. Use it while you have time to do so, all right? Um, what greater regret could you have than, you know, ending and saying, you know, man, I wish I did this. I wish I did that. Leave it all on the field. That actually makes sense. Leave all the seed on the field, right? Leave it all on the field and have no regrets. Pastor Paul. Brother Peter, I appreciate it. Uh, sounds an awful lot like buying the field, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, um, we just need to buy the field, trusting, trusting God without question, without argument, Amen. just faithfully doing those things that he has asked us to do. We're, I'm going to go ahead and invite you to stand this morning, let you stretch your knees. If you would, though, if you would just for a moment, just bow your head, close your eyes. We want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord this morning. Whether you're here today and, and uh, you just need to ask the Lord for help or for forgiveness in the way that you've been sowing, the way that you've been stewarding this precious gift of salvation that he's given us. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've not lived for the Lord. Maybe you, uh, whatever the case may be, I, I don't know all the details and we can, we could run a gauntlet of variables, but whatever may be taking place in your heart, don't leave here without doing business with the Lord. Don't. We come together to worship, but oftentimes we leave no different. We leave thinking the same way. We leave checking church attendance off of a to-do list for the week. God desires a relationship with you. You can only have a relationship with, with him if you spend time with him. So we're going to give you a, a chance to come and to, to spend time with the Lord. I would invite you to come and kneel at the front. The altar is always open. If you are, uh, for whatever reason, if you are, are not comfortable or unable to make your way to the front, please Feel free to, to sit there in your seat or kneel there at your seat. Regardless of the location, my desire would be that you not leave here without talking to the Lord and just spending some time with Him and however He may have 
spoke to your heart. For those of you that may be here, may be watching online, that have never accepted Christ as your Savior, we would sure love to be a part of that. We would sure love to be able to take you to God's Word and show you what He says about your salvation. Take you to God's Word and show you how you can know that Jesus is your Savior and that the promise of an eternity with God the Father. What, a, what an amazing opportunity that would, that would be. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I want to invite you to slip out of your seat and to come to the front and, and get my attention. And I'll let me pair you up with somebody who will take you to God's Word and show you how Jesus can be your Savior. Maybe you're on, watching online and, and uh, you would, would like to talk to somebody. I have one of our men sitting there monitoring our live stream who would be more than willing to interact with you and, and take you to God's Word and show you how you can know that Jesus is your Savior. Heritage has gone 20 years, not because of men, not because of women, but rather in spite of us. Heritage has been able to continue as a body of Christ for 20 years because Christ is the one in control. It is his message of salvation and redemption that we are here to share and with the Lord's help we will continue another 20 years to share that message. I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray. Whether you want to come to the front or stay in your seat is entirely up to you, but, but let's take just a moment to thank the Lord for all He's done and help us as we uh, determine and purpose in our own hearts to continue to sow the gospel message. I want to invite you to look up here for just a moment and we will pray and be dismissed. I want to thank you for being here. Again, if it's your first time visiting, please grab a connection card, fill that out for us so we have a record of your visit and uh, drop that in the offering plate back there by the sound booth. Uh, also, 5 o'clock tonight, we will continue our study uh, of, uh, it's not complicated, wrapping our brains around the Christian life uh, because it's not complicated. Um, it is very easy. We're just look, taking a practical look at Christian living. So please join us at 5 o'clock. Brother Peter, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Dale, if you would please, sir, uh, close this in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for celebrating with us today, and I will be in the foyer for those who would like to talk to me. Brother Dale.